Hey there, Acid Horizon fans, this is Craig. I just wanted to inform you that we will start a new plateau in the A Thousand Plateaus reading group this month on June 25th and 26th. We will be reading How Do You Make Yourself a Body Without Organs? You can become a member of our reading group by just navigating to our Patreon page and signing up for as little as $1. However, this month, we are going to add some new goodies for the $5 members and above. So if you're already a patron, be on the lookout for an announcement very soon. By the way, you can now pre-order the Philosopher's Tarot, the unique tarot deck that I have created in collaboration with Repeater Books. Information and pre-order links are in the show notes. Today, we are discussing the concept of machinic enslavement from the apparatus of capture, from Deleuze and Guattari's A Thousand Plateaus. Okay, let's hop in. Welcome to Acid Horizon, the theory podcast. On today's episode, we are going to conduct a wrap-up of our most recent reading group, which involved reading A Thousand Plateaus, the plateau, the apparatus of capture which we have decided was basically an extension of the treatise on nomadology in a certain sense. But there are some distinct concepts that they do develop within this plateau that we're going to explore today. But even within the constraints of this singular plateau, there are many details, there are many concepts, and there's a lot to dig into. So we have selected certain moments within the plateau that we thought were important or stood out to us and those will be the notion of the sedentary, the idea of the Erstadt thesis. Also, we will talk about their concept of machinic enslavement against the notion of social subjection. And we'll see what kind of interesting connections that we can make along the way. On the show today, I have with us Adam, Will, and Matt. And we're going to try to do the plateau in a somewhat synoptic fashion. So the first thing that we're going to talk about is the notion of the sedentary, the formulation of the state through the establishment of local surpluses. And for that, I'm going to turn to Adam, develop some notes on that topic. Okay. So thinking about the sedentary, you know, the sedentary is what, in a sense, stays still or in a sense, or stays still within a given area. Its motion is captured itself within a fixed territory or a territory that is bounded within certain points that fix it as the sort of territory that is that encloses it. And the question for the last Guattari going off of the nomadology is, at what point does a nomad become you know, a sedent, a, a sedentary uh, tribe of people or part of a state or one of the classes or one of the strata of a state? And ultimately, thinking about this notion of when does one become the other, they turn to these categories of what they call marginality, thinking about the idea of the limit and the threshold. So, so for example, we explain this concept. So the limits, they explain in one, one time through, uh, through drinking, so the last drink you can have is really not really the, the last drink. It's the penultimate drink. Because say if I'm out in a, a night and I'll have a no eight pints or something, I'll say eight, so eighth pint is my last drink. Now, I technically, my hand can move the pint up to my mouth and pour beer into it. But if I do that, I've gone past my, la- my penultimate drink, which is my limit, and I've crossed a threshold under which I am no longer a sort of relatively healthy human being or a being that can walk themselves back home at the end of the night. Now I've turned into a vomiting machine who has to go and get his stomach pumped. Not that I couldn't take nine pints, of course, but, you know, it's completely just completely uh, some, something else there. But the idea is that fundamentally there are certain events in which the nomadic peoples become sedentary in a sense of that essentially they, desire, essentially they have a stock they have they go around hunting, gathering, foraging, and occasionally do exchanges of different groups. Sometimes they even exchange of a state. And say if they get a surplus of seeds, well, you've got to stay there to plant it all because you don't know when your next meal's coming. Ultimately, if you're just you know this nomadic place, you know, nomadic uh, group wandering around in certain uh, landscapes. So what ultimately happens here is that they spend a lot more time in in the same place. They have a stock, and when you have seeds in a bag together, there's a chance of hybridization, and then you could experiment with these new strains and develop agriculture. And this sort of stock is fundamentally what uh, the main presupposition, which allows the kind of the habitual mode of the state to arise. You know, there's the state and stasis. And the, this all back, back to the Erstadt thesis in which as soon as you put your feet down to the ground, so to speak, it's almost like you've always already been doing it. 
because we're just doing the same thing as also for just eating and planting and growing some stuff. But this time we're doing it in the same place. Well, how do we manage this? Well, we've got to be managed somehow. There has to be some sort of division, elementary divisions of labor here or segmented times of work. And the chief of your nomadic bands, well, they, this grand surplus has come in. And, you know, then we have rituals of surplus. We have batai, sacrifices. The chief can solidify into organ, an organizer of becomes a, a political sort of leader with functionaries. And this all ties back to the idea of the Erstart thesis, which is, to my mind, based on Kant's idea of what's known as transcendental apperception. Now, all this means is that ultimately, Every experience you you can have, it must be able to it must be able to be formulated with the words "I think" next to it. So, I think this mug is hot, for example. The "I" is the formal unity that undergirds every experience and makes it such that you can say, "This is my experience." It doesn't always accompany it. You don't always say, "Oh, I think that." Sometimes you just say, "The mug is hot." But the formal accompaniment is what ultimately unifies the entire thing. Now, this this transcendental "I." is not the same as the empirical eye. The, the sense of yourself you get just from you know, feeling yourself in time, being, you know, having an inner sense of time and memory and all that, and the entire inner life, that's beyond that. If anything, your empirical self is kind of a function of this unification of experience. And this unifying function as the eye is, uh, for the Lars Guattari, so far, the elementary form of the state, a division into the empirical subject of its own subjectivity and the grand unifying thing which... But Kant really does set down the law. For Kant, the transcendental I and its, its legitimacy over the territory of experience is the very thing he's trying to set up with the A and B deductions, or particularly the B deduction in the Critique of Pure Reason, which is literally based off of a Holy Roman Empire legal manual for sort of showing your legitimacy in inheriting property. So ultimately, this unification of property is all down to this primordial ability to constitute the state, which is the unity, which is the same thing that we have when we or what, you know, we always stay in the same place. Every experience is always mine. Every experience passes through the territory that is me, but it's the territory doesn't itself move. I don't get you know, the formal unity of my experience doesn't really get bigger. So it's this habitual mode of I thinking, static thinking, which in which when essentially when nomadic groups stop moving about all the time, having reformulate themselves and match themselves to the territory or be matched to it or use it in different ways. This sedentary process ultimately renders them into a kind of a, a sedentary mode of, of, of state capture, where you have, rather than foraging, you have agriculture or a more sustained temporal agriculture. So this is kind of their, their dawn of everything thesis. And I, I may not be doing it a proper justice, but it's it's just good to see where these concepts come into play of Erstadt, the sedentary. They're not advocating that you know no one should ever sit down because then you get captured by the state. But there's trying to explain how this always arose. I agree with pretty much everything Adam said. There's a few things I'd want to add, and I, I didn't see his notes before we recorded this. So I wasn't sure which bits would, would fit where. One is that it, it does occupy a really strange place in their ontology, at least in their ontology, let alone their anthropology itself. Particularly because there's this idea with Eurostat that it, it reappears no, no matter how far back you go in history. Right? There's no point at which you dig a little deeper beneath this civilization and don't find another one just beneath it and so on. Right? It's, it's almost like the horizon which constantly moves as you move closer to it. And on top of that, there's, of course, the distinctly political sort of o- overtones we're trying to sort of explore here, which is probably, at least on one level, the, the, the sense in which the state always presupposes itself, that the moment it's instantiated, it's always already been there in a certain sense, right? Which is backed up because no matter how far back you go and so on. That's about to be argument, at least, as far as I can see it. There's also the other political dimension that, and off the top of my head, I can't remember if this is where if they discuss it in this plateau or in anti Oedipus, but either way, it, it functions to, to use a metaphor of the horizon again, it functions to set the horizon to how we think about power, the nature of the state, its inevitability or not its inevitability and so on, as well as participating in some of the most dangerous and reactionary forces that we see, particularly nationalism, racism, fascism, etc. Because part of what the Urstadt meant to get at, I think, for them is the way that states present themselves in a certain relation to the one that came before. So whether it's something more recent where 
you know, we're fulfilling the ideals of the revolution, which failed, you know, not long ago, but now we're making good on it. Or whether it's a much older, grander claim about the rebuilding of a great civilization, perhaps literally on the ruins and so on, so that it both legitimizes the existing state insofar as it can you know, receive our literacy from this, from this, from this first stat, often mythical, of course, but quite functional. And as a result, can participate in these kinds of dangerous forces too. You know, I'm wondering if when we say, you know, this refers to a revolutionary actor or a failed revolution at a particular moment in history, like I want to drive down the distinction between the Erstadt and the, the constituent, because I think that those are two very different concepts. For me, my question would be, what connects the Erstadt to the development of the subject, right? The subject to sovereign power, right? The I that equals I, which is sort of isomorphic with these functions of state. By way of like a partial answer, and because I think it's, it's actually quite good to probably leave it as a partly open question, honestly. But I think part of the answer is going to lie in the connection that that you can make between Deleuze's critique of a dogmatic image of thought, indifference and repetition, and then in Anti-Oedipus, where firstly that exact theme of critique of dogmatic image of thought returns, but also in the connection they make with royal science, right, and royal philosophy, I think that's how they call it, that there's something in the way that we tend to think about thinking, which produces a form of thought, and then instances of thinking, of philosophy and science and so on, which tends to shore up legitimacy of the state, in a kind of reciprocal relationship. I think we talked about this in the reading group as well, that part of what happens is that the philosopher, part of the philosopher's psychological character, seeks recognition, and it seeks recognition from the state. And the state also seeks recognition, but also legitimacy. So the philosopher often ends up, particularly for political philosophers, Deleuze said on a number of points, number of occasions, often ends up lending the state legitimacy in this sort of circular relationship. And so I think maybe part of the answer there would be that there's this link between the image of thought that we have, the social roles that that thinking takes on, and then the double relationship of legitimacy and so on between the state and not just philosophers, of course, but he talks about science as well and so on. Um, so perhaps part of the answer will be there. Yeah, no, that's great because what we'll see from Deleuze and Guattari is this opposition between the private image in anti Oedipus or like private thinkers, right? So Kierkegaard, Foucault, I think Shestov. <laughs> is one of them opposing figures like Hegel, Kant, who they believe are like absolutely guilty of state philosophy or one or providing the state an image. And for them, once the state has an image, it's all over. Yeah. I mean, Adam's got something to say, but I wanted to add that on that example of Kant, I was, I was reading um, his essay, What is the Night of it Yesterday? And I'm like, I, I we read the line where he says, you know, argue as much as you like and about as much about, and about anything you like, but obey. Yeah, I just wanted to put in the example of Kant again, because, I mean, quite literally, the critique of pure reason opens with an appeal to the state education minister. He is a, he is a state philosopher par excellence. And just to think about the idea of the subject here, I mean, it's the elementary kind of subjectivity. The transit of my perception in Kant essentially opposes a, a division in subject between the thing that legislates the formal unity, the conditions of possibility for any stable unity of experience, and the thing that it legislates over, the, the empirical self. And the empirical self is kind of a functionary of the various functions of the, this magical binding kind of thing. And it, it's interesting to see this in the form of the, how you talk about myths, mythology, about the idea of the emperor, the magical emperor who unifies everything for this hidden knowledge. And of Kant, of course, he's not doing this, but he does talk about you know, the dark art of the soul in schematism that unites the different kinds of experience and faculties together. And there's a Jewish priest. And I guess one of the best ways to explain this in terms of pop, in terms of pop cultural terms is uh, play the game Fallout New Vegas. Look at Kaiser's Legion or Caesar's Legion. It is this idea of there's a magical, almost magical godlike figure of Caesar who overcodes the entire thing. And you know, they say this idea of the one-eyed emperor. They're thinking about Odin, of course. But uh, you can also think about the sense that you only ever see, most people only ever see their emperors on the coins. You know, and you can only see one side of their face. You only see one eye. But that's one way of doing it. That currency is essentially the distribution of this unifying signal of the imperial, which is the elementary unity of all of the subjects under the Caesar. And then the function of Caesar himself doesn't only last throughout the whole, the whole Roman Empire. I mean, it lasts into 
think the last king named after Caesar was, was deposed in the, like the 50s or 60s, I think. Um, I mean, the Kaiser in German, for example, uh, Tsar also derived from Caesar. Um, this kind of mythological function is still very much there. And in Fallout New Vegas, Caesar brings back as a unifying uh, sort of ideology of this new kind of state. And how does it do that? Well, it, it starts with Caesar, who's a member of this post-apocalyptic sort of scientist group, showing up with knowledge from the old world and other worlds and unifying these tribes into war machines. And, and the Caesar's legion functions by capturing tribes through its own military institutions and then redeploying them by absorbing them into military institutions. And it even creates a special class of Praetorians, which are essentially from the survivors of various tribal battles that can essentially execute his will. So the anthropology of, and maybe the anthropology of the Lazantari is better suited to video games, but it's just a better way to explain them rather than going through, you know, everything about, you know, Katao in Turkey and you know, through the stages of the Mongolian invasions and the like. Yeah, I think the the key point that we're ramping up to here, and this will appear again in our discussion about machinic enslavement and social subjection, is the kind of state that forms under what they call the archaic imperial signifier, or the imperial despot, which is very different compared to the kind of state that we see under capitalism. And I think one of the challenges that I had reading this particular plateau and you know, it was echoed somewhat amongst Adam, Will, and Matt, was that there are times where it seems like Deleuze and Gattari may not be either working with all the facts or playing very fast and loose with the anthropology, but I think they correctly identify some of the logical tendencies that exist with respect to the way that states form. And I think that's the major upshot that you get from the apparatus of capture. And what I mean by that is clusters notion of the Erstat is that the state appears all at once. And the way that they challenge this thesis is that how is it possible for a group of people, non-state peoples, to fend off the state not knowing what a state is? It just doesn't seem to make sense in, in a very basic way. So the other postulate then is that, well, it's probably the case that the state always already existed in some form. And so in logical terms, what does this mean? That between disparate groups, between disparate war machines, if you will, there was some kind of intraconsistency between these groups. And there was this tendency for aggregates, or, you know, as Deleuze and Gattari say, certain vectors of groups to want to move into the state form. And there were others that, that did not. In fact, they would say that non-state groups that were more apt to avoid becoming subsumed within a state had certain processes or mechanisms by which to repel the state by introducing what they call a third segment. But I, I, I don't want to get in, into that bit. But I, what's important is this notion of a contingency, that there is no economic evolution, per se, with respect to state and non-state. And they have a very good paragraph here that I'll read out, and hopefully this will kind of sum things up, or maybe there will be some chatter about it afterwards. They say, these societies simultaneously have vectors moving in the direction of the state, mechanisms warding it off, and a point of convergence that is repelled set outside as fast as it is approached. To ward off is also to anticipate. Of course, it is not all in the same way that the state appears in existence and that it pre-exists in the capacity of a warded off limit. Hence, it is irreducible contingency. But in order to give a positive meaning to the idea of a presentiment of that what does not yet exist, it is necessary to demonstrate that what does not yet exist is already in action in a different form than that of its existence. Once it has appeared, the state reacts back on the hunter-gatherers, imposing upon them agriculture, animal raising, an extensive division of labor, etc. It acts, therefore, in a form of centrifugal or divergent wave. But before appearing, the state already acts in a form of the convergent or centripetal wave of the hunter-gatherers, a wave that cancels itself out precisely at the point of convergence, marking the inversion of signs or the appearance of the state. And I think I may have mentioned this in a previous episode. I certainly mentioned it within our reading group. There is a place to get the facts about this, or at least what we understand to be true in our current body of knowledge. It, it, and that is, you know, look at something like James C. Scott's Against the Grain and the history of the city of Ur, for example, and the way in which states 
and their despotic rulers attempted to subsume all of these groups. And we actually have very little proof of the resistance, as it were, because the modes of writing, the methods of recording history and so forth, privilege, of course, the states. They don't privilege non-state people who tended to avoid these apparatuses of capture, as it were. But on that point, I'll just kind of open it up for any sort of concluding comments there. Just one thing I would like to clarify, just in case people uh, misread this a little bit. So to clarify about the unity of experience in, and you know, I thinking, Durs Gontari aren't saying that nomadic peoples don't have subjectivities or experience. It's just their experience is ultimately less confined within the state boundaries of which essentially that he's saying that they're not can't <laughs> that's all they're ultimately saying is there's a different mode of experience that comes with essentially having to motion yourself around territory i mean uh, it's ultimately just a, a different kind of experience that's less confined to the rigidities of being nailed down to a particular state form or a particular form of unification in which you're always the same thing when was the last time anyone lived, who lived in a state became something else that wasn't, you know, through the mediation of what we'll see later on, which is the cybernetics of training in the control society. Will, you had something. I do. I think it's really interesting that Deleuze and Guattari call statification like a sort of centrifugal process. I think it's extremely bleak, <laughs> right? Especially considering the way in which figures that they'll posit as war machines operate on the exact same basis. So, like, this just continues the thread from anti-Oedipus that the problem with capital in the state is that it is just so fast and it operates in the same lanes, you know, if we spatialize their ontology. At least this is what anti-Oedipus tells us anyway, in the sense that once you achieve a certain kind of state, you have the decoding of flows to an extent that creates these opportunities, you know, these lines of flight. Granted, this was written back in 1972 and then 1980, and a lot of the, uh, the predictions did not bear out in the ways that maybe we had hoped. That's why I think the connection between this plateau and the control society are so important. In this way, the control society and the apparatus of capture, I think, are in constant dialogue, where almost all of the revolutionary upshots, and they're pretty clear here, almost all of the revolutionary upshots have unique insufficiencies. And I think Deleuze finds that those insufficiencies are the very ground upon which the control society will function. All right. I think at this time, what we'll do is we'll shift the conversation to this notion of machinic enslavement versus social subjection. But first, a quote. It says here, there is enslavement when human beings themselves are constituent pieces of a machine that they compose among themselves and with other things, animals, tools under the control and direction of a higher unity. But there is subjection when the higher unity constitutes the human being as a subject linked to a new exterior object, which can be an animal, a tool, or even a machine. And we're looking at the section in A Thousand Plateaus, Apparatus of Capture, section 13, where it says the state in its forms. And one of the very first things that they talk about, and one of the very first premises that's important to this notion of machinic enslavement, is the idea that the archaic imperial state is an apparatus of capture which engenders this notion of machinic enslavement. But one of the ways that it does this is, it is in a process of overcoding, that all of the economic activity, all of the social activity within a specific social field refer back to this unity that stands above and codes over it. So when you have a state entity overcome or overtake non-state people, you have this process of overcoding whereby the values and the habits and, and activities of the non-state people now are in this sort of dialogue with this state signifier that stands above it. And one of the things that Deleuze and Gattari claim is that the imposition of this overcoding process, the creation of the state, as it were, entails decoding and the creation of new kinds of flows. For example, within a given group of non-state peoples, you have codes, you have habits, you have norms, you have mores, and what have you. Now, with the imposition of this new unifying entity, not only do you have certain constraints imposed upon them, but you have the creation of new kinds of things. Very specifically, you have money, private property, labor, and all sorts of processes specific to that 
particular contingency. And now the archaic imperial state is going to differ from what will later become the capitalist state. But when I was in grad school, I actually wrote a little bit about the apparatus of capture and the archaic imperial state and its relationship to the prison. Because the way that I see it is the prison almost functions like a microcosm of this archaic form of the state within the capitalist form of the state. And one of the ways that it does that is inside a prison, you have prison guards, deputies, all kinds of COs, and then you have the inmates you know, who are comprised of all kinds of people from different ethnic backgrounds, different classes, and so forth. I mean, primarily folks living in poverty. But what happens is in a severely regulated and controlled environment like the prison, you have these other processes that develop. You have a commissary, you have money coming in, you have modes of exchange, you have a microeconomy that develops between the inmates. And often it's the case that these things cannot be controlled completely, I mean, because it would just be completely onerous to try to mitigate every sort of exchange that happens in a dormitory, for example. So in one sense, it releases new kinds of decoded flows within that environment. But what happens is, and as we'll come to see, even though the state can't play whack-a-mole with each one of these decoded flows, one of the things that it can do is create a way of reacting to them, a sort of double movement, a kind of moving in and a moving out against them. For example, just in very concrete terms, inmates have a very constrained but relative sense of freedom inside of a dormitory during waking hours you know they can play chess or whatever speak with each other maybe they're trading a bag of chips for a cookie that sort of thing but if there's a, an extreme violation of the dormitory rules for example the deputies will go in and they will clear out all of the chips all of the cookies all the papers and photos and everything basically dropping a nuclear bomb on their microeconomy but from there, that will build back up again. So there is a way in which this overcoding process has a sort of, you know, I don't want to say dialectical, but a, a cybernetic feedback loop between the micro economy and the overcoding entity. Adam, what do well, you got? just think about the machinic enslavement quote versus subjectification. Because machinic enslavement as a process has been more intensified in the information era, or what we could also call a cybernetic era, it's a bit more easy to explain. I always think YouTube, because they use the example of TV, but I think YouTube is such a brilliant way to think about this. I mean, subject, for example, a higher unity, say like the norm, it's like a higher unity of the, of, uh, take, take the patriarchy. The, the unity of everything under masculine code signifies masculine practices, masculinization um, of active forces of gendering. And think about creating a human being as a subject in relation to an exterior object, uh, be an animal, tool, or a machine. You can put all three together in one product, bacon. Bacon is one of the greatest cybernetic tools of our era because essentially, for some reason, essentially manly men eat meat they eat raw meat and they eat epic bacon so of course you go and watch all of the epic bacon videos and um of course you're one of the epic bacon people you're all, you're a subject that you, you, you your object is the epic what is epic and what is bacon and of course as you're doing that you yourself as part of an integrated machine of, of profiteering which is you watch the videos people sell you ads your attention is a fully integrated part of a network of feedback of information and of extraction of your time and essentially running your brain power for the sake of capital. That kind of subjectivation happens all the time. I mean, ultimately, this all goes back to the very notion of cybernetics, which is using information to solve the problem of predicting what a body is going to be doing within a within a, the regulation of any system. So, for example, sweating, homeostasis, one of the body's best ways of regulating this, or Let's say another example was insulin pumps. They need sometimes so you need to have a sensor. If you have type one di- di- diabetes, you don't necessarily know when you're about to have a turn, you know, a diabetic turn, a diabetic sort of episode, unless you're already having one. So how do you solve this problem of unpredictability? Well, you ha- you, you get a little information monitor that connects to your phone, and it sort of your phone goes off, and you're at, at just at that point at the limit of the last bit of blood sugar you can go to before you cross the threshold and then becoming into this sort of diabetic sort of turning machine. 
And so you use the inf- information to solve the problems of predictability of, of the body. Are they going to call this machinic enslavement? No, it's only when it's tied to relations of, of domination. The machinic aspect is essentially you are integrated into something that provides information that helps regulate yourself. In the same way the proletarians produce the wealth that is that is used to, to punch themselves down. Or say in refugee camps, there's a great book, Phil Jones, Work About the Worker, came out recently. And in refugee camps, there are these things called micro-work companies. They're essentially, like, kind of like Mechanical Turk at Amazon. Essentially, they're getting, paying half a penny per job to people in refugee camps to help train them regarding facial recognition, voice recognition, patterns of internet searching, and training the very, their part, their integral informative part, informing the very systems of machine learning and sort of artificial intelligence, well, let's say intelligence, that will crack down on them if they ever try and leave. This is machinic enslavement. Ultimately, they don't care about subjectivation in that, unless they're subjectivated as you are a good worker and your object is to work for us. So I've been really interested in this, in these, these concepts the last few days. I've, I've been trying to do some digging. One of, the, one of the points that both me and Will seemed to agree on as we were talking before the show was that there's a really interesting link between this pair of concepts and Deleuze's late essay on the postscript um, on the societies of control. One way I found of explaining this was this way, which is that if you, if you look at, for example, um, Laterato's work, for him, and he, he draws on these concepts very explicitly and, and systematically, what, what the sort of the individual or the subject or, or whatever word you, you would prefer is, is undergoing today for him is a kind of breaking apart from both ends of the, of the, of the, of the pole, basically. So I'm simplifying a little bit, but, but these terms are a little bit strange. I want to sort of at least start with a simple explanation for, for listeners and so on. Which and what would be so? Social subjection makes you a subject. It interpolates you basically. It interpolates you as a male between the ages of 25, 35, straight student, etc. Right, and with all the kind of things you'd expect to go along with that: obligations, norms, fixed identities, etc. It's a kind of stabilization process. But on the other end of this spectrum. I suppose machinic enslavement essentially um, breaks down the coherence of that subject. That functions in two ways, both at a pre-individual or sub-individual, also a supra-individual level too. I don't know what that means. So the first one, when it when does means that it breaks down the subject at a pre-individual level. He talks about this as well, it affects and so on. That's where you get the idea of individuality in postscript of society. Machinic enslavement is what produces individuals, which in postscript become this idea that small slices of data about you. It's no longer all of your data put together in a, or, or all things about you but, but, but actually describe you. It's the fact that you haven't been on a holiday in six months, which can be used in certain ways, you know, in data sets. So, right? so first, that's one obvious link. That's, what's produ- that, that's what produces. It's a process imminent to capital that produces um, individuals. But that larger process that's also breaking things down, super individual level, is related to the individual because it's never just one piece about you specifically that's being looked at. It's enormous aggregates of data sets looked at and understood statistically not specifically usually and has all the sort of predictive function as well of course so for Laterato, there's this sort of dual process where there's a kind of i think there's a passage where he says here this is a quote so he says capitalism reveals a twofold cynicism the humanist cynicism he uses that in quotation marks of assigning us individuality in pre-established roles in which individuals are necessarily alienated and the dehumanizing cynicism of, uh, of including us in an assemblage that no longer distinguishes between humans and non-humans, subject and object, or words and things. So it, it operates on, on, on both levels, he thinks. And I don't want to go on too long, because I know Will's got loads of stuff, and we'll end up talking about this, but, but I could say one, one or two more things. Firstly, Mackenzie Wark has a very good explanation of this. Where she examines it through Lacerato, but there's some very good bits there where, where she's summing this up. In particular, she emphasizes the way in which social subjection is... It, it's a, it, it should be familiar if you've read, you know, or, or looked into sort of um, subjectivation or ideology or Foucault's work, etc. It's meant to operate along similar lines to that. Machinic enslavement is possibly the more 
unique contribution, I think, that they make. So it, it's a molecular thing, rather, it operates on a molecular level, of course, right? Whereas social subjection operates on a molar level. Yeah, I think this is why, like, Lazarado is so frustrating to me. Like, I actually fundamentally disagree <laughs> with, like, the way Lazarado tackles this, and particularly in Wars and Capital. Like, I think <laughs> Lazarado's inca- incapability to grasp the fundamental relationship between the individual and the super individual is why he doesn't understand biopolitics. Mm. But, like, beyond that, I want to first make a point about Adam's contribution, which I thought was really good, where, like, social subjection can function through machinic enslavement so long Mm. as the refrain is, you are a good worker and your object is to work for us. What I would say is, in fact, under neoliberal capital, it's a little bit more complex. It's, you are a good worker and your object is to maintain and include and increase your own capital insofar as that process of increasing your own capital benefits us, right? It's that distinction that neoliberal capitalism tries to do away with between constant and variable capital of the worker that makes machinic enslavement function as well as it does. Because it can recognize the machinic and the constant capital of the worker, right? Their abilities, their capacities, what they can do, how they can do things that I think makes makes this distinction so important. So part of the problem for Deleuze and Guattari that I think Deleuze captures in his postscripts of societies of control is that l- neoliberal political economy already recognized this in the 50s and 60s, and was already capturing all of these motions that could lead to a flight beyond it. So I think that the reason why the tone changes is because, you know, whether it's the work of Gary Becker or others, the theory of human capital is precisely this. So I think that is part of the relation. And to the question of the pre-individual and the super-individual, this is really important to Foucault's biopolitics, and this gets missed all the time, right? The reason why biopolitics functions is because it's a science of individual normality that is always in relation to population data. So any kind of form of aberrance or divergence or straying by a subject is already linked up to an entire metrics of points of data. So this starts, I think, really early in the the physiocratic era where the nature of the event fundamentally changes, right? It's no longer a question of, let's say, preventing famine, right? Or preventing grain from going bad, but it's a question of control. How do we let this event play out? And I think that's the reason why we can say that when this breaks down, it breaks down at at both ends of the spectrum. And I think like we're seeing this now with the recurrence of a critique of cybernetics and of post-human philosophy. And Tante Mollon just put out an entire series of essays (laughs) criticizing political ecology and posthumanism. I had that blog post 10 or so days ago. It's clear that this is coming back into the philosophical collective consciousness. So this is a real problem that we're meeting head on today. And what's part of it is it's this reapplication of the of the critique of the cybernetic is a critical analysis of people working within Guattari's ecology. Even this problem of the post guattarian political ecology returns back to this problem of the uncomfortable complicity between social subjection and machinic enslavement. And that's why I think that this plateau, these two pages are the most brilliant, I think, in the whole plateau. But Craig will go next. So I had some summary comments to wrap this section up, but I know that Matt has some more things to say. But I think it's worth interjecting what I have right now to put a little bit of a glaze on on what we've been talking about. I like what Will said about the ways in which what Deleuze and Guattari are talking about here typifies the neoliberal regime. I would add, or I would challenge Will maybe on the point, just by creating an addition to that, saying that there's a dimension to the creation of individuality, which is to a large extent completely unconscious and does not require any sense of social subjection. And we can understand that through an iteration of the of Deleuze and Guattari's notion of anti-ideology here in this case. And so I'll just read a little bit of what's on page 458 in the Minnesota edition, and then I'll just give you my take on that. They say that 
It could also be said that a small amount of subjectification took us away from machinic enslavement, but a large amount brings us back to it. And that's the point that Adam made initially about machinic enslavement. We, we have the YouTube algorithms and, and, and what have you. But attention has recently been focused on the fact that modern power is not all reducible to the classical alternative repression or ideology, but implies processes of normalization, modulation, modeling, and information that bear on language, perception, desire, and movement. There's probably numerous examples that one could give, and I would not give an exhaustive list of, nor would I attempt to, of all the ways that this is iterated. But one of the things that we might fail to consider is the absolute exchangeability of metadata between different corporations and governments that doesn't occur in any way that's evident to us, but certainly does impact us in per imperceptible ways. With that said, I, I, I kind of hope at, at one time we return to looking at Gerald Ronig's uh, great book, Dividuum, where he goes fairly deeply into this. But with that said, I'll give it back to Matt. I mean, I'd, I'd love to cover that book on the show at some point. I haven't got a copy right now, but it, look, it looks pretty good. But I basically agree with everything that Will said. One of the really interesting things for me is that in the postscript, Alois talks about how he has nothing but praise, of course, for Foucault at this point. But he'll say we are moving already from something like disciplinary society into something new, and he calls it control, right? But of course, he, by this point, Foucault had already seen this as well, right? And it's, it's biopolitical, basically, right? And so for me, the, the two concepts just map onto one another. That's the way I see it. I think what they do is try to draw out different sets of di different things, the causes at work beneath there, and also some of the implications that it has for us as well. For example, what you find with Deleuze is much more attention to the way that data, I think in particular, in a particular kind of digitized sort of sense, is going to be used, as well as an attentiveness to the way that as the enclosures fall down and we leave the the factories and hospitals and so on, because you get visits at home, or why build a prison when you have electronic collars and so on. That, that's those sort of examples he talks about. His point is that, well, on the surface, some of these things, you know, may look attractive in, in some senses, but there's going to be new dangers there. And he, he says something, it'll be up to, to the next generation to discover who, you know, who they, who they are being made to, to serve, right? But I think you're right. This is ex pretty explicitly Foucauldian stuff. And I would, I can't see anything here that wouldn't be um, compatible um, with Foucault. I just think there's different emphases being placed. Uh, that's why the postscript society of society's control is so interesting to read in light of this, because those same processes that they identify in this chapter are what produces the, the situation that Deleuze is, is analyzing in that essay. I, I could reply to Craig's question of consciousness here, I, but like honestly. I, I think that, like, I would just agree that, that a lot of this is done. Yeah. What I'm going to bring it back to is it takes 30 seconds of etymological work on the word statistics to realize just how important all of this is. What is the science of statistics? It's the probability of the stability of the state. What do policy, policing, and polis all share, right? So, like, all of these things, like, and this is the brilliance of this section is that it's not it's explicitly not stagist. It always avoids the stagist urge. It always says that the second and third order of these societies are interrelated or that we don't pass from social subjection into machinic enslavement, but in fact that they inform each other. And this is why I think when we talk about the relationship between Dillas and Foucault, I think like the complicity comes down, like where the two of them are conspirators is on control. I think they're conspirators on this new society of security. And I think that's why they will continue to be, you know, horrifyingly, they'll just haunt us. <laughs> they will right. continue and, to And I us. think what they do here with this sort of scalar notion between social subjection and machinic enslavement is a pretty common move uh, uh, conceptually for Deleuze and Qatari is to identify these two poles and then define various modulations based on intensity between those two poles. So I just want to bring this back to the central notion here, which is capture is what provides the unity of composition. It sort of enforces the presuppositions of its own categories as it sort of forces them on this territory and makes them the law of the land. It constitutes subjects of itself who are functionaries of what the state or what power wants for it to do. Capture constitutes that which it captures at the same time. And it seems weird, how does it all happen at once? 
It is, it is because it forces a kind of presupposition in a way that clears the ground of what it captures and inserts its own categories in place. So the, the best example I will sort of give of this is racialization, particularly in the work of, we all guessed it, Cedric Robertson. It's brilliant. Everyone should go read it. Eventually, there's a kind of constitutive erasure of the sort of ability of the racialized, especially the racialized black subject, to have you know, ontologies, epistemologies, theories, and philosophies and engagements of their own consciousness, forms of consciousness in the act of racialization. And in, in the act of literally capturing them, they are treated as unthinking, essentially primitive, ultimately good for nothing other than a sort of blank slate in which you can put Christianity onto and create a new kind of subjection. And I think capture here, yes, before in terms of putting things into boxes, putting things into sets, and regulating how those sets inform the practice and the operations of power. And this is where the notion of the minority is going to be so important for the Lurs and It's about things uh, just in between sets. They're not quite fitting into either one. And the state is also very anxious about this because what can't fit into their categories can indeed hurt them. So, for example, to go back to Robinson again, the idea of fundamentally the racialism of the European powers was such that they could not affirm any sort of ontology or sort of philosophy or sort of form of consciousness to the African experience prior to the act of capture, prior to the, prior to the act of enslavement. And ultimately, this meant that they didn't want to see, therefore they couldn't see, there's the continuity of African consciousness that came and came back in the forms of uh, fugitive slaves and people like Mackandel, people like the Obeya sort of cultural and religious traditions that would go on to inspire revolts in places like Haiti. Um, ultimately, it's this question of the non denumeral what capture cannot but ignore but cannot fully deal away with, which will be the object of the revolutionary struggle here, the non-denumerable set. I don't know if this is some sort of critique of Badiou operating here, but I'm not entirely sure. But ultimately, it will be what evades recognition and representation, essentially looking at the uh, distinction in cybernetics or you know, between signal and noise. Because the thing is about cybernetics, ultimately, cyberneticians, they, they confuse the map for the territory, so to speak. So everything is about solving problems of information. Therefore, if it's not informative or fit in with my categories of what's informative, then this is all noise and we should scrub this out from the signal. It's an aberrant unpredictability of the body. And this, of course, would inherent ableism of capture will come in. Well, and still, obviously, it's always operative in, on the same levels. So yeah, I just wanted to move into the sort of sections of capture, give some examples and open us up to this, the more revolutionary parts of this plateau as we come to the end of this. I feel like this is where the upshot is, the non-denumerable force that does not take on particular claims. It does not embody particular requests of power, but in fact is something that the axiomatic cannot tolerate. It in itself must become perpetually intolerable in order to stare down what is deemed intolerable in our world. And I think that's what is remarkable about that articulation. And I think it comes from Deleuze and Guattari and Deleuze's, you know, really serious work on the prison in the early 70s. And I, I know we like to think, you know, it was Foucault and Genet doing a lot of the heavy lifting at, at GIP, but Deleuze was, you know, and Fanny Deleuze too, were extremely engaged in these questions. So I think that, yeah, it's an intolerability in the face of the intolerable that I think they articulate so well. I wanted to say a few things there, because I know we do just hear the hour, but this is a really key section in this plateau, and I think we need to talk about it, otherwise we're missing something important. Um, so there's a few passages I wanted to highlight in this discussion of axioms and different forms of the state and the non-denumerable and so on, which I think will help clarify for those who maybe haven't read plateau or Struggle, struggle with this. So part of the idea here is that among the various axioms of a capitalist state, its default tendency is basically to add more ones on, right? That doesn't really fundamentally threaten the system, or at least most of them don't. And so what they're trying to grapple with is the way that some 
let me say demands, but demands, claims, whatever you'd like to say, just aren't compatible and they're not integrated um, within the system. And it's in those moments that you see the almost hysterical outbursts of violence and repression on the part of the state against those groups. For example, they say that part of part of why that, that will happen is that when these incidents emerge or, or these groups emerge and make a claim or, or demand something or so on, that there's always a sign to indicate that these struggles are the index of another coexistent combat, i.e. a combat not just with adding an axiom on, but the very nature of the system as, as such. It's registered sometimes about a state in this way, and you get these explosions of repression. And the notion of the non-denumerable is key there because it simply cannot be within the set of axioms that we have, uh, even by adding new ones on. It's a point of, it's, that's what we seem to say anyway. It's, it's not... It's excluded outside, but needs to be excluded for the stability of the system. And they say that, however modest the demand, it always constitutes a point that the axiomatic cannot tolerate. When people demand to formulate their problems themselves and to determine at least the particular conditions under which they can receive a general solution. And I think it's a really interesting sort of idea. It links into the ideas of a sort of minorities and minoritarians becoming minoritarian as well. I, I don't want to ramble on too much longer. That I know that's a little bit incoherent but it's a key section and, and they're trying they're basically trying to grapple with the question of revolutionary politics in a certain way but which isn't indebted to old forms of uh, sort of orthodox marxism and so on but which can take into account both the emergence of a variety of sort of social movements political movements communities and so on which don't articulate their demands in the ways that a system would really rather like them to and whether this might represent uh, an attack upon uh upon the state i suppose I just wanted to say thanks again for listening. If you want to find ways to support us, just navigate to the show notes. You can become a member of our Patreon, or you can purchase something from our merch store, or check out one of our blogs. The track that you're listening to right now is called I Just Want to See You One More Time by the project Always Other. Until next time, take care.